The answers to your financial questions are closer than you think. GHS Federal Credit Union is here to help you establish your financial well-being. Meet our helpful advisors and get the answers to your questions, like how to earn a credit score or get a loan. Check us out online or give us a call to learn ways that you can save with GHS and set yourself up for financial peace of mind. GHS Federal Credit Union, we're the relationship of a lifetime, here for you through every stage of life. Hello everyone and welcome to Roberson Museum and Science Center's first ever virtual planetarium tour. My name is Christina and I'm going to be your guide for this program. So today what we're going to be looking at is a seasonal sky tour. I'm going to be taking you through a view of our night sky, what it looks like currently, some things that you'll be able to see throughout the evening. I'll show you exactly where they'll be located and I will give you some tips on exactly how you can find these for yourself. Cells. I'll throw on some tips and pointers and some fun facts along the way. So a couple things to keep in mind before we get started. First and foremost, please note that this tour is to be uh, viewed from the evening of August 20th and it is located in Binghamton, New York. So if you're tuning in and you're watching from another location or you're watching this at a future date or time, please note that there is the possibility that what you will see in your night sky will vary slightly from what I'm about to show you. This is meant to be viewed on August 20th from Binghamton, New York. The second thing that I'd like you to take note of while we go through our tour is that I'm going to be sticking strictly to things that are visible to the naked eye. I'm doing this because I want to make sure that anyone who's viewing this tour is able to enjoy and follow along uh, while doing their own stargazing from home, whether you're an astronomer, uh, an amateur stargazer, it doesn't matter. You should be able to go outside and see these things for yourself. And so that's what we're going to do. Not everyone has a telescope. Not everyone even has a pair of good binoculars. So all you need is yourself, your eyes, and your night sky. With that being said, let's get started. So here you are looking at a simulation of our night sky from our planetarium. If you take a look down to the bottom left, southeast, almost all the way to the east, you've got a date and time stamp. I've got a cursor here that I'll use throughout the program to direct you to where you should be turning your attention to. Down here we have our date and time stamp. You can see it is in fact August 20th and we're starting tonight at sunset. So 7.56 p.m. is when the sun will set on this evening. The next thing I want you to take note of is if you look all the way around the horizon, you'll see that our cardinal points are projected for you. So we've got north, west, south, and east, and that's just a visual aid to guide you guys along the way during our tour today. If I say, hey, we're looking north, you know, to look up towards the top of the circle. If I say, hey, we're looking south, you know, to look down towards the bottom. Of course, in real life, when you go outside, our cardinal points will not be projected for you on the sky. So so like I said, I'll be giving you some tips and pointers along the way uh, for how you can figure out which direction you're facing when you're out doing stargazing on your own. This is just a visual aid to help during this tour while you're sitting at your computer today. Okay, so if you look around the horizon once more, you'll notice some odd shapes that are sort of blocking our view, and that's a simulated landscape. Of course, when you leave your home and go outside to do your own stargazing, there will be trees, homes, other objects that are obstructing your view. Uh, here in the planetarium, we have the option to remove that simulation, which I personally like to do and I will do to get started. So we have a nice, clear, unobstructed view of the Horizon 360. The next thing we're going to do is we are going to 
speed things up a notch. If you take a look at the timestamp down in the bottom left where I showed you just a moment earlier, you'll see that things are going to pick up a notch. I'm going to start fast forwarding time just a little bit here because we are at sunset, but the sun has not fully set yet. We're still looking at a lit sky. We need things to be nice and dark to see some stuff, right? So here we go bump it up another notch. And we're going to go forward until about 9 p.m. The sun should be nice and low, dipped beneath the horizon at that point, and we can have a nice clear view of our evening night sky. Here you can see some of our stars are coming into view as the sun's light fades away. And we've got a nice night sky coming through. So when we stop around 9 p.m., like I said, the sun will be beneath the horizon, but you can still see a little bit of its light hazy over there to the northwest. Another thing that's nice to note when you're stargazing, especially from a location like Binghamton, New York, a city, is that there is light pollution. Our planetarium simulates that as well. So we've got some light pollution uh, happening here, and there's also the potential for cloud cover. When you go outside, there's not always going to be a perfectly clear, 100% visible night sky. We may have some clouds in the way, things like that. So always be sure to keep that in mind. Again, we're lucky enough to be able to turn that all off here, so let's do that. There we are. This is what your night sky would look like if you were in a perfectly clear, nice, dark location. And the first thing that pops right up in clear view is our view of the Milky Way galaxy. So if you look to the bottom of our circle here south, you'll see that the Milky Way galaxy is extending directly above the southern horizon around 9 p.m. on this evening. Uh, this is our view of our home galaxy, the Milky Way, from the inside looking out. So we are obviously located, our solar system, inside the Milky Way galaxy. And this very lower portion here that's looking the brightest and the most dense is actually the heart of our galaxy. If you were in a location with incredibly dark skies that allows you to view the Milky Way galaxy, you could take a view right into the central heart of our home galaxy, which is very cool. Unfortunately, here in Binghamton, New York, we do not have the luxury of seeing the Milky Way galaxy that is obstructed from our view here. So we're going to pretend we can't see it, and we're going to move on to something that we can see because I want you guys to be able to figure out exactly where you're looking and how you can find some stuff tonight. So we're going to start off in our northern sky. I personally believe the easiest way to get your bearings about you is to find north. The first thing that we're going to look for today is the Big Dipper very common, very well known. I'm sure you've all seen it plenty of times. So you're going to be looking to the northern sky to find the Big Dipper tonight. It's going to be located, we're just going to make a cross section here from east to west, and you're going to want to be looking in this upper portion of our sky here to the north to find our Big Dipper. Feel free to pause me and give yourself a moment to look for it if you'd like before I spoil it for you and show you exactly where it is. Okay, so over here, almost directly northwest, is where you're going to find our Big Dipper tonight, just here. And it is going to be hanging out on its side, bowl end up, handle end down. These four stars here make up the bowl of our Big Dipper, and these three stars arcing out beneath it create the handle of the Big Dipper. Now, common misconception about the Big Dipper is that it is a constellation. It is in fact not a constellation. It is a portion of a constellation, a larger full constellation called Ursa Major. And you may have heard the Big Dipper actually be referred to as Ursa Major before. Sometimes people interchange them, but the Ursa, but Big Dipper is not its own constellation. It's part of Ursa Major, also known as the Great Bear. So let's take a look at it. Okay, so I've connected the dots for you guys. We've got a simulation of constellation lines here that show you the shapes of all of our constellations in the evening sky. Let's take a look at the Big Dipper again. Here we have the bowl and the handle, and like I said, it makes up the back portion here of Ursa Major, this larger constellation of the Great Bear. So, you know now that you're looking northwest, but we're still looking for north. 
How do we find true north? The reason I had you find the Big Dipper first is because it's actually a great guide to finding our north star. All you have to do is find the bottom of your Big Dipper's bowl, these two stars here, which are facing upwards at 9 p.m. this evening. You're going to find these two stars at the edge of the bowl, and you are going to draw a straight line out across through your Big Dipper, doo -doo -doo, right across until you encounter this first visible star. So you won't bump into any other visible stars between these two here and this one here, and that's where you're going to stop. And right there is your North Star. You may also notice something else interesting about this star, and that is that it is the very last star in the handle of the Little Dipper. So we've got our Big Dipper, and right here is our Little Dipper. This handle and these four stars make up the small bowl, also known as Ursa Minor, the Little Bear. So now, if you have found your Big Dipper, your Little Dipper, and your North Star, you know that you are facing north, and we're ready to get started. The next thing that is interesting to take a look at in our northern sky in terms of constellations is if you were to continue drawing a line straight through your north star and continue across the sky even further, you would encounter this W-shaped constellation right here known as Cassiopeia the Queen. Cassiopeia the Queen is also a very notable constellation and I personally think that it's a simple one to find because of its large W shape. So you guys should be able to continue drawing your line straight across from Big Dipper through the North Star all the way over to Cassiopeia. The great thing about the Big Dipper and Cassiopeia at this point in the evening, 9 p.m. on August 20th, is that now you know which way is east and west. If you want to find your way to east, you're going to turn yourself towards Cassiopeia, the W, and if you want to find your way towards west, you're going to turn yourself over to the Big Dipper, and that will take you over into the western direction. Some other notable constellations in this night sky nearby the North Star is Cepheus the King. This is Cassiopeia's partner, and I like to find this one as well because of its pretty notable shape. To me, it looks very much like a child's drawing of a house. You can see there's a little square here for the house and a triangle shape on top for the roof, and it's nearby that W shape, so that's another really easy one to find. And last but not least, we have Draco the Dragon, and this one is also pretty easy to find because it's usually looped right around around your Little Dipper. So we've already found the Little Dipper. Just find that constellation that's wrapping around in almost an S shape right around your Little Dipper and you've got yourself Draco the Dragon. So let's bring in our constellation labels here so that you can see their titles. And the really cool thing about our planetarium is that it also allows us to project some artwork over our constellations. When you look at constellations in the night sky, it's very difficult to make out what they're meant to be. For example, the Little Dipper, Ursa Minor, is supposed to be a small bear. Doesn't quite look like a small bear. If you look at Cassiopeia the Queen, which is a W shape, W doesn't quite make out a queen, so you really have to use your imagination. We can project some visual aids here that will allow you to see what our constellations are meant to portray. So here are some nice, great colored animations um, for you guys to get a clearer view of those constellations. Okay, so Let's take ourselves back to Ursa Minor for just a second here. Let's look at our North Star at the very end of the handle or the bear's tail and talk a little bit more about why the North Star is a great starting point for everyone who's doing some stargazing. Um, I'm sure most of you know that the North Star is also known as the star that never moves and that's because it's true. The North Star does not move. It is the only star in our night sky that remains fixed in its position. The reason for that is because it's located almost directly above our Earth's northern axis. So I'm going to bring in another visual aid to help you guys visualize how this works. Okay, so 
This projection is called the equatorial grid. These are the Earth's lines of latitude and longitude projected out into space. And you can see where they all converge right around the North Star is a representation of our North Pole. And of course, the North Star is directly located in the center because it's directly above our northern axis. So as the Earth rotates on its axis and all of the other stars are rotating and spinning around the night sky, you'll see that the North Star will remain fixed in its position directly above the northern axis. Imagine you're sitting in a room, you're looking up, I'm in a spinning chair. Let's say I were to look up at a fixed position on the ceiling directly above my head and spin around in my chair. That fixed position wouldn't move around the room as I'm spinning, it would remain fixed directly above my line of sight as I spin in my chair. That's just an example of kind of how the North Star works. So let's demonstrate. I'm going to advance time a little bit. We're going to speed things up and fast forward. You can check out the timestamp on the bottom left again to see how we're moving through the night sky. And you can follow along as the stars rotate around the Northern Star. And obviously keep your eye fixed on a Northern Star so you can make sure it's not moving anywhere. Here we go. There you have it. Everything's moving along except for Polaris, our North Star. It'll stay right there in the center. Okay, so now we fast forwarded until around 11.30 p.m. And the last thing I want to show you with our equatorial grid here is that in the very center portion near the North Star, there are the other few constellations that we spoke about, Ursa Major, Draco, Cepheus, and Cassiopeia. And the other reason that I like to mention those constellations in particular is because they all have something in common. If you notice, they're all very centrally located towards um, the northern axis as well, very close to Polaris. And because of that, all of these constellations are known as circumpolar constellations, meaning that they are visible at all times. They never dip below the horizon. So no matter what time of year or what time of night it is, as the Earth rotates and our stars rotate around our night sky, the stars of those constellations will always remain visible above the horizon. So that's another reason that I really like to point those out for anyone who's doing stargazing because they're always going to be there. So if you're looking for north and you've lost your direction and you're trying to figure out where to look again, as long as you can find near around Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, Cassiopeia, Cepheus, you know that you're looking at the northern sky because those circumpolar constellations will always be there. Okay, so let's remove our constellations here for a second and take us back to a clear night sky. So We've gotten a pretty good in-depth view of what's going on in the northern sky this evening. Let's take a look to the south. So if you direct your attention down to the southern portion of our sky, we are going to look at some objects. There are five planets in our solar system that are visible to the naked eye. That is Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Those five are visible to the naked eye if they are above the horizon in the evening time. And we are just so lucky enough to have some things to observe. Now I've brought in some labels and some markers to show you the planets that are going to be visible. Around 11.30 p.m., if you were to look to the south, you would see Jupiter and Saturn which is really great because those are two of our larger planets, which I think makes them very easy to find. Um, you are going to start again, if you've lost your way, find your North Star, if you're facing north, all you have to do is turn directly 180 degrees to behind yourself to look back um, and find the southern horizon, and that's where you'll find Jupiter and Saturn. Again, at 11.30, there will be a third visible planet that you can spot above the horizon. If you look almost directly to the east, which is our left on this projection, you'll find Mars. Mars is also incredibly easy to find. We'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second. So those are the three planets that you'll be able to see at this time. You're probably noticing there's a few other things floating around here. Um, all the way to the east, you'll see Uranus. 
uh, to the southeast, you'll see Neptune. And those obviously are two other uh, planets of our solar system, but those are not visible to the naked eye. Those you need the aid of a telescope to find. So unfortunately, we're not going to talk about those today because, um, like I said, we're speaking to visible objects only. Last but not least, we also have Eris and Ceres that are um, above the horizon at this time. And if you're not familiar with those names, that is because they are not planets, but they are dwarf planets. Um, you may have heard, I'm sure, that Pluto is no longer a planet in our solar system. Unfortunately, Pluto is located directly between Jupiter and Saturn at this time. Again, not visible, so we won't be talking about Pluto today, but uh, Pluto is now known as a dwarf planet. So Eris and Ceres are a couple of the other buddies in Pluto's dwarf planet club uh, since he got demoted. He's not alone. He's got some other dwarf planet friends in the solar system that he can hang out with. So moving along, let's talk a little bit about Jupiter. All right, there's Jupiter. We've got our target set on it. So how do you tell the difference between a planet and the stars? When you're looking out at the night sky, there's a lot to take in. There's lots of bright specks all over the place. How can you tell the difference between a star and a planet? Well, planets tend to move in relation to the background stars behind them. What this means is because stars are far more distant than our planets are, they tend to be a backdrop to the planets. So as the planets are moving throughout the night sky, you'll notice that they tend to move across the stars as opposed to with the stars. Stars don't move in relation to each other. They stay in their groupings. They stay in their constellation shapes as they move as one. Uh, planets don't do that. They differ from the stars, and you'll notice that they tend to move across them. Uh, that's actually gotten them the name uh, wandering stars. They're often known as wandering stars because they tend to wander off as opposed to sticking with the pack. And that's how you can tell if you're looking at a planet or not, if you observe for an extended period of time. So let's take a closer look at Jupiter. Okay, here we are. So here's what Jupiter will look like tonight, up close and personal. We're actually going to speed things up again here for a minute. If you check the timestamp again, you'll see that Jupiter is going to start rotating on its axis, and we're going to turn things around. You'll see that uh, some of Jupiter's moons here, which we'll talk about in just a second, will start to orbit around the planet as well and move. And we're going to bring things around so that we could see a very prominent feature of Jupiter's surface as we come around here in just a moment. And there it is. So we're going to stop here and you're going to see that just off to the left there, you can get a nice view of Jupiter's great red spot. Here it is, very commonly known. And here are some fun facts about Jupiter's great red spot. As some of you probably know already, this is a large storm that's taking place on Jupiter. And just to give you an idea of how large the storm is and really how large Jupiter is, the largest planet in our solar system, of course, you can take our entire planet Earth and fit it into Jupiter's great red spot almost three whole times over, which is pretty insane. It's massive. Um, so that's just a good idea of how large Jupiter actually is. Um, let's talk about some of Jupiter's moons, which will again give you an idea of just how massive Jupiter really is. So if we zoom out just a tad, you can see some of Jupiter's moons here. The four most famous well-known moons are the Galilean moons. We have Callisto, Ganymede, Europa, and Io, which is hiding out behind Jupiter right now in its orbit. Those are the Galilean moons named after Galileo, as he is the one who discovered them. 
Uh, and those were actually the first moons that were discovered in our solar system beyond our own moon here on our home planet Earth, which is very interesting. Um, another idea of how massive Jupiter is, let's take a look at Ganymede. So Ganymede is Jupiter's largest moon, and it's actually the ninth largest object in our entire solar system. It's so large, in fact, that it is even larger than the planet Mercury. Again, I know insane, massive. So let's bump out one more time. Um, another fun fact about Jupiter is that, as you all know, of course, we have our one moon here on Earth, and there are varying numbers of moons for all of the planets in our solar system. For example, Mercury and Venus don't have any moons at all. We have one, Mars has two, Jupiter is a show-off and has 79 moons. Jupiter has 79 moons. Insane. And they're not all labeled here. You can't see all of them. I know it doesn't look like 79. That's because our system only will um, locate and label the largest ones. There's too many. <laughs> so that's what we can see uh, from here. All right, let's come on back down to Earth. Great, here we are. So we have advanced in time throughout the evening and you may have noticed that we're looking at some new things at this point. I'm actually gonna take the time back just a notch here. We're gonna rewind a little bit. I think we got too far looking for the great red spot. Okay, so let's stop there. And let's take a look at what's going on here. So now we have already seen some of these things. If you haven't stopped to take a look at Mars yet, this is a great time to do that. Now, I don't know about you guys, but if you take a look at the timestamp. It's 4 a.m. at this point. I'm not awake at 4 a.m. If you are, here's what you'll see. So Mars is located almost directly south at this point. Um, the really great thing about Mars is Again, if you want to go out around 1130, you can see it almost directly east. If you're out around 4 a.m., you can see it almost directly south. Again, find your north star to get your bearings about you and find your way around to your cardinal points to figure out exactly what location you're looking at. Mars is really wonderful because it shows up in a reddish orangish hue. So it's really easy to find it and sort of determine the difference between the planet and the background stars. It's much brighter and it's got a different sort of tone to it, which makes it pretty easy to find. And that's really great. Um, the last object that we're going to be able to see on the evening of August 20th is Venus. Now, Venus I get particularly excited for because it is actually the brightest of all of the planets. It is the brightest visible planet that you guys will be able to see with your own two eyes, and it's pretty spectacular. Very easy to find, very bright, very prominent, and it will be located almost directly to the east around 4 a.m. just before sunrise if you're looking to catch a glimpse of it. Um, Venus is so bright that you can actually almost see it in the daytime sometimes, which is also really incredible, um, but you can definitely spot it, of course, as long as we don't have a cloudy night sky, you can definitely spot it to the east before sunrise on the evening of, well, now we're August 21st, so the morning of August 21st before sunrise. For those of you wondering about some of the other new objects that have come into view, again, we won't focus on these because they're not visible, but I just wanted to let you know that we have two more dwarf planets that are moving across the southern sky around 4 a.m., and that is Makemake and Haumea. And those are two more of the dwarf planets in our solar system that will be making their way across the sky. All right, so when you're looking at the southern sky, another really interesting thing that helps you sort of connect where everything is located is this imaginary line right here called the ecliptic. The ecliptic is basically a trace across the sky of the sun's apparent annual motion across the sky. So if you look at the red imaginary line, you can see that the months are labeled across it, and that indicates the position of the sun in the sky at that time of the year. The other really cool thing about the ecliptic is it also connects all of the planets. 
for the most part. You can see Mars and Venus are sort of astray here a bit, but they all follow along the ecliptic as well. And that's because all of our planets orbit essentially on the same plane. So they follow essentially the same path across our sky over the course of the year. Okay, so we have our planets, we've got the sun, and the last thing that you'll be able to find along the ecliptic is our zodiac constellations, which I know some of you take particular interest in. So let's take a look at those. If we remove our planets here for a second and bring our constellations back in, starting over in the east and moving our way towards the west, you can see Gemini, Taurus, Aries, Pisces, Aquarius, and Capricorn. So zodiac constellations, this is where they come from, or your zodiac signs. This is where they come from. The zodiac signs that are located along the ecliptic, as you can see, line up with a month, and that's how you're assigned a zodiac sign based on your date of birth. It is in relation to where the sun is positioned at that time of year. So an interesting tidbit about your zodiac constellation is that the worst time of year to see it really is on your birthday, um, because that's where the sun will be positioned. It will be in front of those stars during the daytime, making it impossible to see that constellation. Really the best time to observe your zodiac constellation would be at the opposite end of the year. So if we have a summer birthday, we would really want to go out and try and see your zodiac constellation in the winter time. Okay, so as we follow along the ecliptic, let's bring in our artwork here. Let's make note of Taurus the bull over here towards the east. Now, in Taurus the bull, that constellation has another very interesting feature that I like to point out because, again, it is visible to the naked eye. Right here in the shoulder of Taurus the bull, towards the end of this constellation line, you will be able to see a star cluster. So, let's take a closer look. Okay, so this is a star cluster known as the Pleiades. This constellation, excuse me, constellation. This star cluster is known as an open cluster. As you can see, the stars are not very tightly, closely grouped and crammed together. They're more separated. They're a group, but they're a bit more open as opposed to a globular cluster, which is the other type of star cluster um, that has more densely packed stars all grouped together, very tightly knit. Um, I also really enjoy talking about this particular star cluster because for those of you who are car owners, you may be looking at the star cluster and noticing that pattern of stars and thinking that it looks sort of familiar to you. And there's a chance that you have seen this before. This is actually the inspiration for the logo of the Subaru Car Company. This is that collection of stars. When you're done watching this tour, hop on Google, Google Subaru Car Logo, and you'll see the Pleiades here. Uh, and that's because in Japan, this star cluster is actually known as Subaru not the Pleiades, it's known as Subaru. So that's where that comes from. All right, let's come on back down from our zoomed in view here. And let's take a look. Oh, actually, one more thing before we move on. Another really neat way to find the Pleiades star cluster is to use the constellation of Orion, another very famous southern constellation that you guys will be able to see, again, around 4 a.m. if you're awake. Um, at this time, you can use Orion's belt to find the Pleiades. So let's remove our constellations here because it will make it a little bit easier to see. Over to the east, you'll find um, Orion is an X shape with his belt of these three stars in a line going right across the center, making up Orion's belt. And that is kind of an arrow that'll point you directly to the Pleiades. If you cut a line straight through Orion's belt here across the sky, you'll bump into the star cluster of the Pleiades. Again, that is visible to the naked eye, but even if you have a pair of binoculars at home, it looks incredible through a pair of just some binoculars that you may have lying around your house. So definitely check that out. Now, 4 a.m., here we are. This is the best time of night to see something pretty special. Um, we are looking again at August 20th, but you may have heard that there is a meteor shower going on currently. 
Um, there is the Perseid meteor shower that starts mid-July and goes almost towards the end of August. The peak nights were the mornings of the 11th, 12th, and 13th-ish, so if you were able to go out on those nights, that was the peak time to view it. You probably saw something pretty spectacular. Um, if you haven't gone out and looked at it yet, there is still a chance that you'll be able to catch some of the Perseid meteors. Um, so you may have heard of these as a shooting star before. Of course, it's not actually a star. It is, in fact, a meteor. So I'm going to do a simulated meteor shower for you right now. Here we are. This is enhanced, of course. This is a sped up version of what a meteor shower would look like. And the really cool thing about meteors is that, as you know, meteoroids, as they're orbiting in our solar system, they are meteoroids. As they're entering the Earth's atmosphere and burning up and creating this streak of light that looks like a shooting star, they're known as a meteor. And if they're lucky enough to make their way all the way through the atmosphere and land on the surface of our home planet Earth, then they're known as a meteorite. Um, hopefully, our planetarium will be able to open up again here in the future for you guys to come visit us in person because we have an incredible meteorite sample in our planetarium that we have on view. We allow our guests to feel it, touch it. Um, and examine it, and it's really, really great. So please come by and visit us when we're able to again so you can see that meteorite sample. Um, okay, so the last thing we're gonna do here is we are going to fast forward one last time, and we're gonna move our way past our meteor shower into a sunrise. Here she comes. Okay, so that concludes our star tour. Let's bring back in our landscape. Have a nice, beautiful morning. That concludes our seasonal sky tour. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, please stay tuned. We are planning on doing some more tours for you guys. Um, they'll be coming to our social media. I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope you guys get out there and do some stargazing on your own. Uh, thank you very much, and bye, guys.